So today we are ending off our series called Chase the Lion. And uh, I just loved the series, Every Moment. It has been an inspiring, inspiring series. And I really believe a spirit word for now. Absolutely awesome. So during this series, we've explored lion chasing skills, where we've um, explored chasing our dreams, facing fears, and defying odds. And uh, during the series, we've been talking about a guy called Benaiah. And uh, Benaiah was this brave man we find in 2 Samuel who crossed paths with a lion on a snowy day. And what was so amazing is, is that Benaiah didn't run away from the roar of this lion. He ran towards the roar. But this morning, we're not going to talk about Benaiah. I want to introduce you to someone else that we find in 2 Samuel 23. And he was one of the three musketeers. Yes, the original three. When I was a young boy, my granddad, he asked me to go and find the three musketeers in the Bible. So, Google wasn't invented yet then, and um, so I had to really go and search for it, and I couldn't find it, so I went back to him. I, th I think he knew I wouldn't find it, but I went back to him, and we sat down, and he opened the Bible in 2 Samuel 23, and he introduced me to the original three, the three musketeers, and one of them are Eliezer, the person that we, I want to share with you about this morning. And um, I think the Three Musketeers needs to pay the church some royalties. All right? Let's read the story about Eliezer together in 2 Samuel 23, verse 9 to 10. Now, next to him was Eliezer, son of Dodai, the Aohite, as one of the three mighty warriors. See, there it is. He was with David when they taunted the Philistines gathered at Pastamim, for battle. Then the Israelites retreated, but Eliezer stood his ground and struck down the Philistines till his hand grew tired and froze to the sword. The Lord brought about a great victory that day. The troops returned to Eliezer, but only to strip the dead. See, Eliezer was a mighty, mighty warrior. Imagine being so determined to fight for your dream that you fight until the sword freezes to your hand. And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. Five ways to fight for your dream. Because it's going to be a fight. It's going to be this heavyweight title fight. And it's not going to be easy because dreams don't come easy. So let's start at the start. Number one, define success. I think that we need to define success because if we are talking about fighting for a dream, it better be a dream worth fighting for. Listen, if you succeed at the wrong thing, you have failed. And I think if you fail at the, run, wrong, at the right thing, even if it's just for a season, you have succeeded. Steve R. Covey said this. He said, most people spent their whole lives climbing the ladder of success only to realize when they get to the top, the ladder has been leaning against the wrong wall. Whoa. I would rather fail at the right thing than succeed at the wrong thing. I don't want to get to the end of my life, I don't know about you, but then realize that it was all in vain. That I pursued the wrong dream. I believe we need to define success for ourselves. And uh, if we don't do that, what's probably going to happen is our culture is going to define success for us. Here's my definition of success. Success is when those who know you best respect you most. Those who know you best respect you most. It's not complicated to me. I want to be famous in my home. I want my children to look at me, and I want them, when they look at me, to be the best dad that I can be in their eyes. And the only way I'll be able to be famous in my home is when I surrender to the will of God for my life. You see, Benaiah and Eliezer, the two guys that we've been talking about throughout this series, figured something out. They figured something significant out, and it determined their destinies. Also, I think that's the reason why we read about them in the Word of God today. They figured out what they were willing to die for. See, you need to know what battlefield you are willing to die on. You need to know what fight you are willing to fight. 
You don't die when your heart stops beating. You die when your heart stops skipping a beat in the pursuit of the dream that God has put in your heart. So we need to quit living as if the purpose of life is to arrive at our deathbed safely. Because we can't do anything there. I believe that God has called us to live a full life. The Bible says that God has called us to live a life, but an abundant life, not just a normal life, amen? But you have to know what this dream is. You have to know what you're willing to fight for. Now, every one of David's mighty men that we read about in 2 Samuel 23 knew what they were fighting for. And hopefully through this series, you uh, had some time somewhere where you could read through this passage of Scripture in 2 Samuel 23. And if you did, you would see that the, mighty, the three mighty warriors were listed, Benaiah is listed, and then there are 30 other great men of God listed in this passage of Scripture. And one thing they all had in common... They were willing to lay their lives down for David because they had a clear defined goal to protect David and seem crowned as king of Israel. Now David's mighty men could have had a much better time if they were a part of King Saul's army. They would have had better food. They didn't have need to hunt for their food then. They would have had better housing. They didn't have to stay in exile and stay in tents or in caves. Also, they would have had better weapons. But they knew that they but they knew what they were willing to fight for. They knew what they were going after, and I believe in the same way you have to know what you are fighting for. And I think Jesus is the embodiment of this. In Hebrews 12, verse 2, it says this, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame. And sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Can I ask you a question this morning? How do you endure nine inch nails through your hands and through your feet? But not just endure it, but scorn its shame. Jesus had a dream. And that dream is you and me and our salvation. Amen? He went to the cross to reconcile you with your heavenly Father, and He was willing to die for it. You see, for Jesus, success wasn't overthrowing the Roman Empire of the time, even though He could. And a lot of the Jewish people of the time thought that was what the Messiah was supposed to do. But Jesus knew the end game. And it was all about the end game for him. It wasn't about earthly kings and it wasn't about earthly kingdoms for Jesus. No, it was about the eternal end game. He knew what he was fighting for. The dream was for Jesus and still is to this very day, you and me and our salvation. And that meant someone sinless needed to go to the cross of Calvary and die there so that you and I may have life. I just love Jesus. So we need to define success. See, Jesus knew success wasn't overthrowing the Roman Empire. He had the end game in mind. Number two, take it one step at a time. Now, Forrest Gump, he said this, my mama says life is like a box of chocolates. And that's my best southern accent. I've been practicing all week. Now, if life is like a box of chocolates, then your dream is like a box of puzzles, puzzle pieces. Your dream may look like this then. And I think we wish that when we open this box of the Eiffel Tower, that what's going to pop out is the Eiffel Tower. I'll, I'll pick that up later, Pastor Chris. So... But what we see right here isn't a fully assembled dream, right? What we see here is a bunch of puzzle pieces. It's a big mess. It's 500 puzzle pieces to be exact. So fighting for your dream is most probably going to be a 500-step program or process. You see, you're going to overestimate what you can do in your own strength in one year 
and you are going to underestimate what God can do with your dream in 10 years. It is going to take longer. It is going to be harder than you ever thought, but it is a process. And can I just say this this morning? I believe that it's important to have this dream, but more importantly, who we become in this process of pursuing this dream. So let's not despise the process. Let's embrace the process. You see, we may want fully assembled success. Maybe it's because of the times that we live in. We we want results immediately. But that's not how dreams work. There are no shortcuts and there are no cheat codes when it comes to our dreams. Now on this puzzle box, um, there's a picture of the Eiffel Tower. And uh, way back in 1889, the World's Fair was in Paris. So just a side note, the World's Fair will be in Dubai next year, 2020. It will make its grand return. And what the World's Fair is, I went and Googled it because I didn't know what it was. And uh, what it is, it's just an opportunity for all the nations of the world to come and bring their best ideas, um, technological and engineering ideas. And um, I think it's going to be amazing next year in Dubai. But anyway, in 1889, the World's Fair was in Paris, and lots of people presented their plans for the centerpiece of this World's Fair. But Alexander Eiffel proposed his dream, and his dream was this tower, a 984-foot tower that would be the tallest building in the world at that time. They loved Eiffel's idea so much, so they they gave him the go-ahead to build it. So what Eiffel did is he gathered 72 scientists, engineers, and mathematicians to help him make this dream a possibility. In fact, their names are inscribed on the Eiffel Tower to this very day. And I believe without their collective brilliance, Eiffel would not have been able to build this tower. And then there were the 300 carpenters, riveters, and hammermen that it took to gather 18,038 pieces of wrought iron puzzle And then it took them two years, two months, and five days to put it together. Oh, and then there were these acrobatic team members that came and taught these carpenters, riveters, and hammermen how to balance on high high beams in high winds while building this tower. I'm sure after this experience, all these guys put that on their CV, acrobatic team member. So what am I getting at this morning? Your dream is not going to pop out of this box. It's probably going to be a 500-step process, but you need to know what the dream is. That's the important thing. You need to have a clear picture of the dream. So when I pick up this box, I've got a clear picture of the Eiffel Tower, right? I can see it. I can visualize it. I know what the end product should look like. But then what happens is I open the box And I take out these unassembled pieces and I roll my sleeves up and I get to work. And I start building this dream one piece at a time. And that's the only way that we can put it together. You see, Proverbs 29 verse 18 says, Without a vision, my people will perish. So it's good to have a dream. The reality is that God placed the dream that you feel this morning and that you dream about this morning in your heart. It is his dream for you. I have a dream. I would love to get in shape. My wife also has that dream for me. And uh, I know the only way that I can get in shape is to uh, one workout at a time, right? The only way that I can get out of debt is through managing my finances, but also one paycheck at at a time. I will earn a degree one class at a time. I will become a good musician one practice session or one rehearsal or one performance at a time. And I will get that amazing job promotion one project at a time. So it's not, it's not going to be easy. It's going to take time, and we need to be patient to put this dream together. Amen? But I believe with God's help, all things are possible. So take it one step at a time. Number two, uh, three, excuse me. Number three, get around the right people. This is a small preposition, but I believe that it has huge implications. The scripture that we read earlier, 2 Samuel 23, we saw it said that Eliezer was was with David when they taunted the Philistines at Pastamim. 
You could say he was in the right place at the right time with the right person. I just want to say this. It's not about you and it's not about me. Our lives are for the glory of God. Amen? But I'm also going to tell you this this morning, that God is setting you up. He is setting you up to win. I have no question that he is building our resume and he is building your network because he wants to use you for his kingdom purpose. And a part of that, I think, is getting around the right people. Now, Proverbs 13 verse 20 supports this notion. And this is what it says. It says, walk with the wise and become wise. For a companion of fools suffer harm. Walk with the wise and become wise. In week one, Pastor Chris said, one of the best of, in week one of the series, Pastor Chris said, one of the best ways to discover your dream is maybe to serve someone else's dream. It's to serve someone else's dream. And I would say, if you don't have a dream this morning and you're like, Freddie, I, actually, I don't know what my dream is, I want to say, get around a dreamer. Get around a dreamer. Because it won't be long until something contagious happens to you and you have received this dream and that you're just ready to gun it, ready to go for it. And that's what we see in Scripture. With these three characters, characters Joshua, he climbed Mount Sinai uh, with Moses when Moses received the Ten Commandments. And then Elie Elijah shadowed prof the prophet Elijah. And Ruth would not leave her mother-in-law's Naomi's side, even though her husband and her mother-in-law's son passed away. And their loyalty paid dividends. This is what happened to Joshua. Joshua took over from Moses, and he led God's people into the promised land. I don't think when Joshua was serving Moses, he thought that he would ever lead Israel into the promised land. Also, Elijah. Elijah got Elijah's mantle, right? But he didn't just get his mantle. What happened was Elijah asked God for a double portion anointing. And I don't think Elijah had any grounds to ask for something like that if he didn't journey year after year with the prophet Elijah. And what is amazing is that God gave him what he asked for and he was able to do double the amount of miracles than Elijah ever did. And then lastly, Ruth gets a second chance at love by marrying this rich guy, Boaz. Thank the Lord for Ruth. And they had a boy named Obed. And Obed had a son named Jesse. And then Jesse had a son named David. It's amazing to think if Ruth would have left Naomi's side, Jesus would have never been born. Because Jesus was born out of the lineage of David. So Ruth became the great, great grandfather, a mother, sorry, of David. So you have to get around the right people. It is very important you have to choose your friends wisely. So just before I go on, I just want to say this. This is not about targeting people, right? This is not about trying to get something from someone else or to use and abuse anyone, not at all. Like I said earlier, I believe God is working on our resume. He is making a way for us where there seems to be no way. He is connecting us with the people that we need to be connected with so that we can fulfill our purpose and destiny in life. So what I'm saying is, is that you shouldn't just run off to the CFO or CEO. The reality is each and every single person that you come in contact with has wealth buried inside them. And we can learn something from every single person. So this morning, if you look to your left and to your right, you will see wealth next to you. Wisdom next to you. Greatness next to you. I can see it from where I'm standing this morning. A sea of beautiful people. And at New Life Church, we want you to get involved. We want you to get connected with beautiful people. And the best way to do that is to come to church to get into connect groups, and to spend time with people who love the Lord Jesus, but not to spend time with them to gain anything from them, but to spend time with one another so that we can build into each other's lives. When I say wealth, it's not a physical wealth, right? 
It's wisdom. It is strength. It is vision that we can learn from one another. And I believe we can do that right here. So if you want to find the right people, get around the right people, you're at the right place. Amen? So number one, define success. Number two, take it one step at a time. Number three, get around the right people. Number four, adopt a growth mindset. I believe that just about anybody can do just about anything if they work hard enough, long enough, and smart enough. Now just a little disclaimer here. Using myself as an example this morning, I will probably not play prop for the Springboks in this year's World Cup. Would have loved to. You know, just imagine scrumming against the beast in a practice session. Even if I practice 10,000 hours, it's not going to happen because there's some genetic limitations right here. <laughs> I've prayed about it. I've asked the Lord why. He, um, he said dynamite comes in small packages. Hallelujah. <laughs> So, yeah, but I really believe anybody can do just about anything if you are willing to fight for it until your hand freezes to the sword, if they are willing to devote their lives to something bigger than themselves. I love this. It's not about the size of the dog in the fight. It's about the size of the fight in the dog. So if I was a dog, I would have been a Jack Russell. Most definitely. A lot of fight and a lot of a heart. All right. There's a great book out by a lady called Carol Dweck, and it's called Mindset. And um, in this book, she makes the distinction between two mindsets. The one is a fixed mindset, and the other one is a growth mindset. And this book is just great for anybody, um, great for parents, coaches, marriages, life. I just think it's a great, great, great read, and it will just inspire you to see that um, God has just created us amazingly. But she describes these two mindsets, and basically this is what she says. She says, a fixed mindset believes that your qualities are fixed in stone, and you can't do much to, ta- to change it. But a growth mindset believes that your basic qualities can be cultivated through effort. She also says, with a fixed mindset, it tries to validate itself, and it, it always feels on trial, where with a growth mindset, it tries to st- always stretch itself and always wants to learn and develop. A fixed mindset is focused on outcomes. They will only celebrate, or a fixed mindset will only celebrate if he's achieved something, where a growth mindset is focused on inputs. So he would say, you know, I know it's hard, but let's look at how far we've come and celebrate that we've come thus far. And what happens most often is that when you realize how far you've come, it gives you the energy again to continue working hard. Fixed mindsets, when you fail, you are a failure and it becomes a part of your identity. Well, with a growth mindset, when you fail, you're not a failure. It was just a fail attempt. You can maybe just study a bit harder. You can maybe do it again, try and try and try again. It doesn't influence your identity. I really believe that anybody can do just about anything. And it's not my words. We read it in the Word of God. Philippians 4 verse 13 says, I can do all things through Christ Jesus who gives me strength. Amen? So I found this quote that I think says a lot about how we see perfection. And this is what it says. It says, with everything perfect, we don't ask how it came to be. Instead, we rejoice in the present fact as though it came out of the ground by magic. And I think this is true of success. You see, we may look at people that we admire and we would see their success, but we won't always know what it took to get there. We don't necessarily want to go through the pain and the hardship and the hard work, but we want the reward. I want to introduce you, if you haven't heard of this guy before, he's a South African sports superstar and a person a lot of South Africans look up to, and his name is Chad Leclo. And like in the first service, no one knew who he was, because <laughs> the ladies didn't go, whoo or anything. I was expecting something like that. But anyway, if you don't know who Chad is, Chad is an Olympian, a gold medal swimmer, and what we see... We see Chad today, when we look at him, we see 
the glitz, the glam, the glory, the gold medals, and all these achievements, but we don't necessarily know what Chad needed to go through to obtain these awesome things. I found this article um, that it, um, they interviewed his coach at the time. Um, his coach name was, uh, or is, I don't know, it might not be anymore, but Graham Hill. And he shared some insight into Chad's success at the 2012 Olympics. And this is what he said. He said, the preparation of Chad for the 2012 Olympics was planned 24 months in advance. So that's two years before that event. But the real preparation was obviously the endless years and training before that. Now, he said that Chad Leclerc started swimming at the age of eight, eight years of age, and Graham Hill was his coach for 12 years. He said this dream basically started in 2008 when he came back from the Beijing Olympics, witnessing Michael Phelps do the seemingly impossible, and that is win eight gold medals at a single Olympic Games. And he said when he came back to South Africa, Chad came running to him saying that he wants to be like Michael Phelps. He wants to swim butterfly like Michael Phelps. But he wants to win and beat Michael Phelps in that race. At the time, Chad's coach looked at him in shock because he just witnessed the most amazing thing, the most decorated Olympian of all time doing the impossible, winning eight gold medals. Now this young boy, a 16-year-old Chad Leclo at the time, came and proposed this dream of beating the world's best in the 200-meter butterfly, which is arguably the hardest event in aquatic sports. Now, in preparation for the 2012 Olympics, Chad Leclos swam an average of 55 to 60,000 meters a week, practicing twice a day from a Monday to Saturday. And we had to remember that he was 20 years old when he won the gold medal. He started with his dream at the age of 16, so he was still in school. So he had to go practice at 5 a.m. every morning, 5 a.m., go to school, come back, and practice again. Working on the seemingly impossible dream. Now, on the day Chad jumped in the pool at the Olympics in the 200-meter butterfly final, he didn't just win by jumping into the pool. If we look at the footage today, he had to swim till the very last split second. What happened was he beat his childhood hero with his very last stroke by 0.05 of a second. Now that's what it takes to fight for your dream. Chad's coach said another thing which I loved. He said, Chad was a different kind of breed. He was different than any one of the other people he's ever trained. He said he could motivate Chad, push him longer, drill him harder, and he never took anything and put it on his shoulders and walked around with blame. Whatever criticism he, took, he got, he took it and he made something positive about it. And Chad definitely had a growth mindset. Now, this morning's talk is not about going out and working hard, the self-help talk. It's awesome to win a gold medal, but what I'm talking about today is achieving your life stream the destiny and purpose that God has called you for. And I believe Chad is still going to do amazing things even after he has won all the gold medals that there is to be won. I believe the only way that we can do this is with the help of the Holy Spirit. It is all about stewardship. God has given you time, talent, and treasure, and we need to work at it. We need to work at it. Potential is God's gift to you, and what you do with it is your gift back to God. One day when we stand before the Lord, he's not going to say, well thought out, good and faithful servant. He's not going to say, oh, well said, good and faithful servant. He's going to say, well done, well done, good and faithful servant. And if I can quote Nike this morning, just do it. Let's do it. Let's go out there and do it. Let me tell you one more story. This is a story about Leonard Cohen, and he wrote the song, Hallelujah. It has been performed and recorded through hundreds of artists throughout the years. Um, a British magazine named it the, one of the top 10 greatest tracks of all time. The lead singer of U2, Bono, he said this, it might be the most perfect song in the world. And it just came out of the ground like magic, right? Well, if we read Cohen's story, we realize that it took him four years to write the song. He said it was pure agony writing the song. I think that's why he called it hallelujah. When he was finished, he went hallelujah. 
It is done. It is finished. You see, he wrote 80 verses, 8-0, 80 verses for this one song. And at the end of the day, after four years, he edited it down to four. Nothing comes easy. Success does not come easy. And I think what I'm getting at this morning is, is that I do not believe in magic, but I do believe in the favor of God. The favor of God is what God can do for you that you cannot do for yourself. I believe in favor and I believe in anointing. I believe that God has anointed us to fulfill a purpose in life. You see, when we look at the Old Testament, we see that God anointed and appointed kings. He anointed and appointed prophets. And I believe today that God has anointed and appointed you and I to fulfill a purpose and a destiny on this planet. I believe that God has anointed us to fulfill a purpose. The anointing is supernatural gifting beyond human ability. The anointing is supernatural revelation beyond knowledge. Anointing is supernatural power beyond human strength. You see, you have been anointed and appointed to fulfill your destiny. But we can't then just say, okay, Lord, thank you for blessing me with all of this. You do all the work. See, we need to, if we want to play in this game, we need to enter. We need to be a, take part. We need to play the game. You can't just pray like it depends on God. You have to work like it depends on you. Because the Bible says faith without works is useless. So we need to adopt a growth mindset. Amen? Lastly, number five, fight until your hand freezes to the sword. Now, if we look at the Bible and we only see it as a book full of stories, 66 books full of stories, then that's all it will ever be for us. The characters in the Word will only be characters in a storybook. And that is the amount of power that it will carry in your life. If the Bible were only through made up stories, then the, the 500 pound lion that Benaiah faced could have might as well just have been a trained circus lion. And by the command of its train aid, would stop fighting Benaiah in a split second. But that's not true. I believe that every word in the Bible from Genesis 1, in the beginning was the word, till the end of Revelation, which concludes with amen, is true. Every single word. And if we see it as truth, the truth then carries power. Then when we look at these stories, we realize that these mighty men had one option. They either needed to fight or die. It was a win or die situation. And the greatest warrior that we read about in the Word, in the Bible, is Jesus. 2,000 years ago, Jesus said, On this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. I just want to say this. This wasn't a meek and mild statement. This was the king of the universe the God of angel armies declaring war against evil. You see, when Jesus hung on the cross, he said this, he said, tetelestai, which means that it is finished, it is done. And I believe that when Jesus said tetelestai, it wasn't a moment where people couldn't hear what he was trying to say, it wasn't this whisper. I believe when he said tetelestai, it is finished, it echoed through the universe. Everyone in the universe knew. Every spirit knew that the victory has been won. When Jesus rose after three days and he, came, and he rose with the keys of Hades in his hands, he didn't walk out of the tomb with a defeated posture. I believe that Jesus pulled his shoulders back and he walked out of that tomb saying to his angels, let's do this thing. Amen. This kingdom is going to come. My will will be done. In May, we will be voting for a new president on the 8th of May. And it is a wonderful privilege to vote. It is our duty to vote. And I pray that God will have his way 
for South Africa. But you know, long before the South African democracy was found or any other democracy in the world, the kingdom of heaven was already established. God's kingdom was found with the cornerstone Jesus at the head. And if you would have placed your bet back in Jesus' day on the Roman Empire or the 120 in an upper room, I'm sure every day of the week we'll place our bets on the whole Roman Empire. Because how can 120 people change the world like they did? Well, I don't know if you've realized, but the Roman Empire doesn't exist anymore, but the kingdom of God does. Hallelujah. The kingdom of God does. In fact, just like us this morning around the globe, billions of people are bowing their knees to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. His kingdom is going to come, church. His will is going to be done. I have no doubt about it. On earth as it is in heaven for South Africa and the rest of the world. The question this morning is, are you going to become a part of this game? The big game, the end game. Fighting for kingdom purpose. As I end this morning and as we end this series, I know we've said a lot. We said that we needed to chase a lion. We said that we need to face adversity and we spoke about how to overcome adversity. We said that we need to do the right thing even if we look foolish and um, we need to fight for our dreams. But it's easy to sit here and listen to something like this and not do anything with it. But I just truly believe that God has given us a command Tetelestai, it is finished. Charge. Let's stop playing offense with our dreams and with our lives. Ach, defense. Let's play offense. I love this. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. I don't know what 500 pound lion problem you are facing today. I don't know what 500 step puzzle you need to put together to reach your goal and your dream. But the one thing I want to do this morning is that I want to commission you. I want to commission you to fight for your dream. My friend, you need to fight for that marriage. For the girl that you fell in love with the day you met her or the man you fell in love with the day you met him, fight for them. Charge your marriage. Your kids, fight for your kids. This is a difficult one because we need to fight not with a weapon but with love. And you fight for your kids on your knees before the Lord. That addiction, that issue that happened, that habit that reoccurs and that breaks you apart. We can't play defense with the devil. He's won. The victory's won. Jesus won the war. We need to chase the lion. Amen. Let's go for our dreams. Let's run to the roar. Because that's what God has called us to do. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for this word. Thank you for the confidence that we have in you, that, you know, that we know that you go before us. If it wasn't for you, Lord, I don't know where we would, where we would be. I don't know what fears the people are facing this morning, Lord. I don't know what trials they might be facing. You know every person's heart here and every person's situation. But the one thing that I do ask, Father, is that you will give us the fire and the zeal to fight for what you have given us, to fight for the dream that you've placed deep inside of us. At the end of the day, Lord, it's not our dream, it's your dream. And thank you, Father, that you are fighting it with us. Thank you, Father, for this series and how we've just been so spiritually led in this time of day to, to know that you want us to fight and that is what we're going to do we're going to fight until our hand freezes to the sword because we know that we are part of your kingdom it's such an honor to be able to build your kingdom with you Lord so we thank you for this word we thank you for the victory that we received through Christ Jesus we love you in Jesus name Amen Amen Amen. thank you Freddie what a beautiful word a word in season, and it was his birthday this last week, and so happy birthday, my darling brother, we love you, so proud of you.
You know, this has been a spirit series for us as a congregation, and I feel as, uh, as, a, as Christians, as the Church of South Africa, to chase our line. And that line can represent a dream, fears, opportunities, problems, whatever it is. And God's calling us to have a holy faith, a holy courage. Amen. And it uh, comes by us saying, Jesus, we need you. And uh, to lead into what he's calling us to do, regardless of the odds that may be against you. And he wants to show himself strong on behalf of every one of us. And so we have a gift for you when you leave today. It's a bookmark. Uh, it's called The Lion Chases Manifesto. And you know, political parties have their manifestos, but we as citizens of God's kingdom have our manifesto, which is from the Word of God. And uh, there's also this lovely Lion Chases Manifesto that comes from a lovely guy called Mark Batterson. A uh, lovely pastor. He's also authored numerous books. And so I believe it's something that we can declare um, as the Lord leads us. And so what we're going to do is if we can stand as a congregation before we go and we're going we're gonna to declare these truths and uh, every truth I believe you can find uh, in Scripture. And so it's going to come on the screen and uh, let's say it together as one congregation, one family. And let's really believe that this is uh, something that we're going to live by on a daily basis. On the count of three, let's start with Lion Chases Manifesto. One, two, three. Lion Chases Manifesto. Quit living as if the purpose of life is to arrive safely at death. Run to the raw. Set God-sized goals. Pursue God-given passions. Go after a dream that is destined to fail without divine intervention. Stop pointing out problems. Become part of the solution. Stop repeating the past. Start creating the future. Face your fears. Fight for your dreams. Grab opportunity by the main and don't let go. Live like today is the first day and the last day of your life. Burn sinful bridges. Blaze new trails. Live for the applause of nail-scarred hands. Don't let what's wrong with you keep you from worshiping what's right with God. Dare to fail. Dare to be different. Quit holding out. Quit holding back. Quit running away. Chase the lion. Can we just give a praise offering to Jesus? We love you, Jesus. Lord, I thank you that the word, this word is a word in season for each one of us. God, give us grace. Give us wisdom. Give us your power. Lord, it's not by might nor by power, but by the precious, powerful Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit, you've begun an amazing work in each one of us. And you're going to help us complete it, achieve it, to reach our full redemptive potential in you. I pray, Lord, that you'd breathe new hope and new life and new faith in every heart here. And right now, Lord, I'm just aware that there's maybe someone here that has never, ever accepted and begun a new life in Jesus. And just as every head is bowed and every eye is closed, I reckon there's maybe someone here that you kind of feel that you're going to pay for your past. You're going to pay for your sin. You heard the word today where Jesus said, Tetele, 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 it is finished, and he said it's paid in full. Your sin has been paid in full through the blood of Jesus Christ, a Savior who went to the cross for you and me, that we do not have to pay for us, and he has paid for it already. And this is grace that he gives you the gift of eternal life in Christ Jesus. And all you're going to do is simply say, Jesus, be my Savior. Jesus, be my Lord. I can't do this alone. Your greatest need is to know the love of God and Jesus Christ. Your greatest need is to have a relationship with the bread of life, the one that can only fulfill you and satisfy you. And he's here right now knocking on the door of your heart and saying, would you open your door and open the door and welcome him in? Whether you're a prodigal son or daughter who's run from God, or this is your first time, would you simply call on the name of Jesus? And just say this, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Jesus, save me from my sin. Forgive me of my sin. Jesus, give me a new heart. Change my heart of stone into a heart of flesh. Jesus, be my Lord. Lead my life. Guide me. Empower me 
to glorify you until I see you face to face. In Jesus' name, amen.